People have always come to America driven by the common need for safety, survival, and security. Drawn by the promise of freedom and future opportunity. Yeah, for me, it was three times harder, I will say, because I, it was three countries that I have to go through. And then when I went through Mexico, they, the coyote put us into a trailer with a whole bunch of bananas in, inside. And uh, 100 people were in, in the middle of the trailer. No food, no water, and pretty dark. We were in there for two days, not eating anything. We came here actually legally. We crossed the bridge uh, with a visa and a passport back when I, in 2001, I was nine years old. And um, it was during Christmas time. And uh, my dad was here already. He had come earlier in September that, of that year. So we were just coming to visit him, uh, uh, spend Christmas with him. But family, we didn't want to separate again, so we just ended up staying here. Yeah, I was only a year and a half old, and when they came here and crossed the Mexican border, I was only a year old. So I didn't remember any of that. The reason why I do remember Guatemala is because I had to go back about two years ago, and I remember like the culture shock, how different it was from living here and like living over there, and I was very surprised. It's too much crime, uh, too many issues, and I don't know, I mean, uh, I don't want to take the risks every day with that kind of violence. And when I come to the United States, they, well, I guess I can start again. I was thinking if we were going to make it out of there. Because we were, everybody was breathing the air conditioning of the uh, semi-truck. And that, that semi-driver says, uh, told the coyotes, when we stop at the, uh, you know, at the uh, crossing the uh, to the other side, I'm gonna turn off the uh, the fan for 30 minutes. So he did. 30 minutes went by. 35 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, and and we feel like we were out of air inside. But then the air came back on, and we were able to breathe again. Immigration is linked to the human spirit which searches for hope in difficult circumstances. Like many of our ancestors before us, Latinos are finding that hope in America. In fact, by the end of the century, a majority of Americans will trace their family lines not to Europe, but to Latin America countries like Mexico, Guatemala, Cuba, El Salvador, Colombia, Argentina, and other parts of Central and South America. These are people the U.S. government defines as Latinos. This new and diverse immigrant population has been growing steadily from 6 million or 3% of the U.S. population in 1960 to 52 million or 16% of U.S. population according to the most recent census. The rapidly growing Latino population has been and will continue to be a great force in the U.S. economy. Their current purchasing power alone is estimated to be $1.2 trillion. Economically, socially, politically, and culturally, Latino growth is impacting our nation and our communities. Consider some recent facts. Though numbers vary by region, contrary to popular belief, nearly three-fourths or 74% of all Latinos in the nation are U.S. citizens, either by birth or by naturalization. The number of undocumented Latinos, those who came here legally and overstayed their visas, or those entering without authorization, has declined from 12 million in 2007 to 11 million today. Often these new immigrants settle in rural or urban areas that reflect their cities of origin. Currently more than 50% of the Latino population lives in California, Florida, and Texas, with highest concentrations in large cities. Uh, more opportunities over here in the United States. You can get a job over there, but uh, you can make uh, enough money to have like a decent life, so that's, that's why I to decide to come over here. So I can give them a better, uh, better life. I think, uh, you know, we, we risk our lives when we cross the border. We come here, you know, to, to looking for a job, that's why we come here. Nothing else, you know, to try to help our people back home. 
75% come to join a close family member. Most enter legally with the hope of finding better jobs. Some are fleeing violence or poverty, looking for improved living conditions, and the ability to provide financial help to family back home, where, in Mexico for example, the minimum wage is approximately 60 cents per hour. For most of the 11 million undocumented, there is no path to citizenship. The current immigration system is broken. Those able to pursue legal documentation encounter an immigration process that is heavily bureaucratic, expensive, and delayed. But I remember getting a letter in the mail saying, like, we had to be in Guatemala on this certain day. And, like, we just had to, like, pack up and go. And I remember, like, I don't exactly know the legal process, but I remember that one day I had to go and, like, talk to them in the Guatemala embassy. And they had, like, told us, like, since you entered the country illegally, your apology letter needs to be processed because my dad had, was already above age when he entered and he, that takes six, to, six months to one year. That's what the people told us. And I just remember like being distraught. Like I remember thinking, I thought it was only gonna be there like a week, two. And then like I had to stay there for six months. Like generations of immigrants before them, Latinos are learning life in America is good, but not always easy. Figures show that while 58.9% of Hispanics age 16 and over are working, they earn an average weekly salary of $500. That is less than any other minority group. Only one in five are working in professional or managerial capacities. Recent U.S. Census statistics also show Latinos experience one of the highest poverty rates, with 26% of Hispanics living in poverty. More than 30% also lack health insurance. Their documentation status also makes many ineligible for jobs, assistance programs, and driver's licenses, leaving them at the edge of a culture they want to embrace. It's safety. There's a lot of violence in Venezuela and corruption. And it just seem, it seems like a safer and more honest place to grow up in. And that's why my parents decided to raise us here, so we could have more of a moral maybe lesson from the society as a whole. Maybe they saw it better than they saw society in Venezuela to be our role model. I know in some ways some people say, well, it's not your place. Well, I guess the place, the pl your place is where you live. You know, you are part of that place. And I've lived here for 13 years now. That's more than I lived in Mexico. So uh, this is, my life now. I don't think I'd be able to live in Mexico again. Maybe, but it, I'd have to start all over again. <laughs> like I love being here or else I wouldn't have fought so hard to be back. Yeah. Now I'm document. Um, I went to Colombia. Um, I went to meet my husband family in El Salvador and I feel very blessed for my new life my husband, my baby, um, now we are a family of seven <laughs> and my life changed for better. I have been teaching in a local um, public school for the last 10 years and I have had Latino students in my classroom every year, sometimes 50% of my class and sometimes just a few students. We as communities can go a lot further in helping our community members understand that people are here working, you know, they're, they're here for that purpose. They come here to work just like we all do. They come here and they often pay taxes and they're contributing to our local society. And if we didn't have documented or non-documented Latinos in the Fox Cities, um, our economy would really, really suffer. So I think the, that need for immigration reform is so very important. Um, those who are here uh, and, and really pushed here by poverty or violence in, in their own countries. I can't imagine anyone who is happy and safe and healthy in their country 
to want to leave. Without getting into the politicalness of it, there needs to be some sort of path for citizenship for the Latino community. It's not doing any of us any good to still have that lingering question of citizenship. They bring a strong work ethic, uh, the importance of family um, and, and of working and, and honesty. Those are beautiful values, things that I think we, we cherish and, and they show to us again. My hope is uh, to be a better person, you know, godly person, and to give the best uh, for my family. Uh, yeah. Help other people. Help another people. My future dream is to become an ESL teacher. English is a second language. Um, kind of knew that when I started learning English, so. I, that's my dream, and also to have my brother and my sister go to college. They're here to, in our community to make not only their own life better, but everyone else's. They're hard workers, they're respectful. Um, I have to say, it's been a total positive experience. Because of the value system and that, that strong work ethic, I really look to see how they can make a community grow further into the future as they move into those higher level positions and, and gain that educational experience and, and really live that American dream and, and, and take that, that tenacity and the fire that, that they seem to have um, and really give back to the community that has helped and supported them through you know, some of the tougher times when, when they're on the lower end of the economic scale. As a community, I think we can go a long way as communities in general to be more welcoming and inclusive. That means more welcoming of people that don't look like you, that might have different customs than you, different celebrations, and different languages. As our nation's largest minority group and the fastest growing segment of many areas, Hispanics are shaping our communities. How will we respond?